Look, hi everyone. Um, welcome to what is going to be a very quick update from us uh, just with the recent volatility in markets. We thought we should put something out um, so you can hear from us, understand sort of what we're thinking, what's happening, that sort of thing. So um, you know, speaking of some of that volatility, what have we seen, guys? We've seen the, the ASX 200 down uh, almost 6% for the month in the last, in the last, in the last month. Uh, down 1.3 today. Uh, Dow Jones was down 0.9 overnight, uh, 6.2 for the month. The stocks index, based out of Europe, down 2.9. Uh, well, last night, um, down 6% for the month. Um, and I guess all the talk has been around uh, banking contagion and um, impact on, on Australian banks and are we having another GFC? Uh, all those sorts of things, and so look, we just thought we'd we'd uh, give you our thoughts on on that. Um, what's happened? Uh, what's happening around the world? What's happening in in um, in Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley Bank, that sort of thing. So, Chris, do you want to uh, talk us through firstly SVB Bank? Yeah, definitely. Um, I th well, I guess over the last probably well, let's call it week, probably all happened on Friday, really, over and over the yeah. weekend. Um, where that has been the predominant headline, um, well, at least the starting headline for let's let's call it the most of this week, um, and as most people would know um, by now, at least in the in the headlines, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank or what people are calling SVB um, was it didn't necessarily default, but has been taken over by uh, the American regulators um, because. Uh, there was concerns about its ability to continue to operate. Um, now, that happening um, as a small regional bank, well, it's not necessarily small, but a regional bank in the US, and when we when we say small, we're talking about not like a, um, a Wells Fargo, like a JP Morgan, a Chase, the, the, the big yeah. institutions, um, obviously smaller than, the, than them, uh, is some concerns about is there any risks within the banking sector as a whole? Uh, what are the specifics that's happening in that particular situation? Um, and there has subsequently uh, been a significant level of fear across that sector, uh, but that has also then spread to the banking sector. Um, but then also, as obviously as everybody knows, banking is um, very well integrated into the rest of the uh, financial markets. Are there issues that we need to worry about a la 2008, where uh, obviously everything um, went into Armageddon mode. Mm. Yeah, I think it's pretty well put, Chris, in terms of summation there and, and what's happened. And, it's, and look, at it, when we see the headlines and you see a bank uh, disappear, it, uh, it never reads well, right? And I think if you sort of wrap it around, put in some context of what's taken place is, you know, you use the word for cam contagion, essentially the, the run on deposits is what has kind of triggered the the uh, you know the stability of Silicon Valley Bank and subsequently their uh, need to then call on their own bonds, which were actually trading at a, at a lower valuation than what they otherwise would have been. And you know I think all things considered, uh, you know if that contagion risk wasn't there, all that run on the on the deposits wasn't there, then I don't think we see the situation today. But the reality is we are seeing it right now, and of course when we do see that uh, headlines always uh, you know sort of spark our or catch our eye, don't they? Because uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty hairy one, that's for sure. Headlines are designed to do that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make it doesn't make that uh, that fear emotion, I guess, when you're reading it, uh, no. although they're designed to do that way any easier. Um, yeah. So I guess we've spent the last few days kind of digesting some of this to see how it actually all kind of lays out. Um, and I guess whether there's any, you know, need for us to change anything, there are any I guess systemic risks that we need to be aware of. Hmm. Well, I, I think I think also like always these things, uh, you know, the, the risk is real, right? There's, there's never any way to sugarcoat it because when there is a, a fear out there, it's, it's a real thing that can't be ignored. But at the same time, I think uh, as we consistently talk about, uh, reacting to really short-term news is never yeah. uh, a, a thought that we. Uh, jump at and it's not to be dismissive at all of what's actually happening out there because what's happening is actually very serious but at the same time uh, reflecting on you know, how to respond to that I think is the most critical uh, decision that we all are faced with at this point in time and subsequently you know I think certainly uh, letting the dust settle letting things calm a little bit uh, I think you know is, is always the most sensible pathway when, when we've got this kind of you know 
you know, peak in, in fear and emotion out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so cool, Shane, you were talking about before, I guess the, the, uh, the bonds that Silicon Valley bank held, um, do you just want to go into, I guess, a bit of an explanation, I guess, of what specifically happened with Silicon Valley bank and maybe why that, um, is different from the rest of the banking sector? Well, I think it sort of speaks a little bit to their clientele, right? So some background behind Silicon Valley Bank is, is as the, for those, you know, sort of tech people out there, Silicon Valley is where a lot of the startups uh, have existed you know, from a technology point of view. And it's been by and large one of their preferred banking uh, partners to, to fund their business. So they're kind of, the nature of their clientele is very different to, to that of a normal bank. And as, as that sort of fear about will they survive uh, has kind of gained a little bit of momentum these sort of startups are kind of starting to call back their money and they have got kind of a similar uh, threshold like we have here in Australia for 250k of uh, you know deposits secured but anything above that we're starting to see we saw that sort of fear so just a bit of background about how banks are capitalized is that you know obviously they they um, hold bonds like like we do in our portfolios on any given day and bond valuations as we've seen and talked about at length over the last 12 months have suffered you know on the back of a really sharp rise in, in interest rates so I guess when when you think about how a bank meets its obligations to pay back its its you know investors or give their their, their customers their money back, they need to call on their their bond holdings to to cover that money back. And in the short term, bond valuations, as again what we've all experienced in portfolios broadly, have come down. Uh, the nature of those bonds are still quality bonds, and will still kind of revert back in time to to par. But at the point in time when that's physically needed, as in right now. Bonds are being sold at a discount to what they're actually physically worth. And that discount is kind of exacerbated or has, and it did exacerbate the loss in which uh, Silicon Valley Bank felt. So subsequently, it's kind of almost the perfect storm that, you know, it's sort of run on deposit, you know, liquidating assets to, to meet those deposits. Yep. Uh, and, you know, you get this squeeze of cash and, and a shortage of cash. And, you know, hence... The, uh, the outcome that we've that we've met. So I know it's a very simplistic way to describe it as best I probably can, but it is a fairly complex piece behind the scene. But I think that kind of gives a good indication as to how it actually happens. Uh, and yeah, and and subsequently we get this outcome where the bank is, doesn't exist anymore, which is quite scary. I think um, the other thing to, to add there is we've seen bond prices rally in the last five days as well. Well, since last Friday, US Treasuries, US 10 years, US two year bonds, same here in Australia. Um, and then that that just speaks to how you know, we talk about it all the time, but it just speaks to having diversification in your portfolio as well. So that's also been interesting because um, you know, potentially now the expectation is somewhat changing, potentially changing, who knows if it actually has, around um, what, what the Federal Reserve in the US is going to do with interest rates. Uh, what's going to happen here in inter with interest rates. But obviously, they were still expecting them to go up, but now that's been tempered somewhat by a change in, in bond yields. So um, that's the markets at play and this diversification at work as well, which is uh, important. Yeah, it's, I think that's a good point, Cam, because, yeah, we've we've you know, felt the pain on bonds in the last little Absolutely. while, and now we actually, this scenario that's unfolding here is actually causing the opposite. Bonds are actually increasing in value right now, which is, you know, quite unusual but interesting cam i think to your point there to to pad that out a little bit further if i can is the is the the shift in in bond yields or short dated interest rate expectations uh and i think the number yeah chris correct me if i'm wrong yesterday was about 0.8 percent was the expected decrease in interest rates in the us uh in the next sort of six months as compared mm. to a week earlier where we're still looking at rate rises so it it really does I think again highlight the significance of this massive experiment that the, the US Fed and the central mm -hmm. banks of the world are undertaking. And I, I would have it as a guess that there'd be many people at Silicon Valley Bank today that'd be fairly aggrieved about the rapid rate yep. in, in, in interest rates, because undoubtedly if that didn't take place, That's we probably right. wouldn't even be having this conversation, right? So yep. right. Uh, but again, exactly to that point is that the the movement now is is expectation or likelihood of rates falling. Uh further and quicker than what was otherwise expected yeah. with the with the 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 reason why that expectation has changed is that if the fed or the whoever of the reserve bank continues to raise interest rates is that you end up with situations where you're breaking more institutions potentially like this so 
um, you know, that's the, I guess, one of the things that we've kind of been talking about over the last couple of days. And obviously in the news we've been hearing about is that word contagion, you know, how, what's the likelihood that this is going to spread through the rest of the, um, the banking sector or the, the world as a whole. And uh, that's what everyone's essentially trying to assess. I think um, what's been interesting is around the share prices of Australian banks. Mm. The CBA is down 1.6 in the last five days, which yep. is nominal. It hasn't. It's barely moved. Yep. So yeah. the market assessment of that risk is low, very low. Yeah. Well, if you look at the... Of course. Go on. Capitalize. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you look at one regulatorily... In the US, there's multiple regulators. Here in Australia, we have one. Um, and the, the, I guess, what we call capital ratio, so how much uh, financial security the banks are required in Australia to keep on hand versus their American counterpart, counterparts is actually higher. Um, and that is a result of um, the financial crisis in 2008. I was going to say 2019, but that's a bit closer, uh, where you know the Australian banks are... Uh, we, because there are so few, um, they're all too big to fail. So APRA stepped in and said, we need to uh, be watertight. Um, some felt that that was maybe um, overly conservative, but I guess when you come across periods like this, it gives you a bit of security in the, um, in the knowledge that Australian banks are in a significantly more uh, stable position than their American counterparts. And I think even to that point, Chris, back in financial crisis, I mean, the Australian banks were arguably the envy of the world at that point in time too because oh, yeah, correct. Of, our, of our capitalization of our banks at that stage. And, and yep. in many instances, the US have kind of followed suit and tried to kind of implement similar uh, banking philosophy and framework to their to their banks since that time. Uh, but not, again, in Australia, we've kind of taken that, exactly to your point, that extra level of, uh, of securitization of our banks to make sure that we are actually quite okay. Uh, so look, I think and to, I think it's a very valid point, Cam. I hadn't seen that number on CBA. That's a uh, you know interesting market. It hasn't been too fearful about uh, you know CBA as a, as an example here in Australia. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, that's right, exactly. And I think uh, just to, uh, probably worthwhile mentioning overnight what happened with Credit Suisse in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, now Shane's kind of walked through the intricacies of um, Silicon Valley Bank where their I guess what they do with deposits is different to the rest of the banking industry. Now, credit, credit Suisse, I guess, is another, um, I guess, what we want to call isolated or quarantine case in that respect where they, the Saudi investment fund that had put money into them um, over the last couple of years sort of basically said overnight that they don't want to put any more money in. Um, now, to your point, Cam, earlier when we were talking about this, um, that could also be a good thing because they don't feel they need to put more money in. Um, mm -hmm. to protect the investment that they've already had. Uh, but there was a bit of concern there, and subsequently, obviously, the share price got, got belted overnight. Uh, but the uh, Swiss National Bank have stepped in and said they'll provide liquidity for any withdrawals if they need to so that the bank doesn't have to sell its assets um, and reduce its capital ratios, yeah. essentially putting it at risk. So the Swiss National Bank have stepped in and kind of said, well, you know, we'll, we'll back this because... Well, obviously, Credit Suisse is a significantly large institution. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yeah, and, I think, and again, reflecting on that, uh, I hadn't uh, seen that that snippet about the the uh, central bank helping out there, Chris. But the it's interesting because that's exactly what happened in the financial crisis, wasn't it? Is the uh, yep. the governments all stood stood in and you know back their banks across the board and it kind of stopped liquidity issues and and yep. kind of get the flow of money sort of reopen again. So I think that's if right. anything from the fact that that's fairly recent history in 15 years ago is that it's still pretty fresh in the, in the, in the minds of the regulators today and the governments Absolutely. of the day. So, you know, hopefully if anything, that's a, that's a good thing that we've got uh, in our corner at this point in time. Yep, mm -hmm. definitely. They've definitely acted in a much faster manner than they did in 2007. Um, months which, in 2008. Yeah, so um, all right, guys. Well, look, thanks very much. Obviously, if anyone's got any questions about this, reach out to either of us, one of the advisors. I'm very happy to jump on the phone, have a conversation. Um, it's it's always an anxious time when markets move and, you know, our role is to um, be there and, and help explain what's going on, So, which we've done pretty well today. All right. I was just going to say, for those who have watched this directly via YouTube, um, 
rather than clicking the email link, there is an email going out uh, with this video. So depending on how you access this, for those who are subscribers to YouTube, um, check your inbox if you're a current client. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye for now. Ciao.